Welcome back guys to the Beyond Condition podcast, the voice of bodybuilding and today's voice, we're going to spell it right from the off, is Scarlett Hollands, who has sometimes been confused as Scarlett with two T's, but if you're looking on Instagram, it is not. Stresses me out, honestly stresses me out. <laughs> unique. Yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? It's like always, if I have a consult with someone, I'm like, can I just check your name at the start, just in case? Hundred uh, percent. It, it's it's such a minor thing, but it's something I think because it's happened all my life. It's like such a small thing, but it bothers me that people are that ignorant that they can't just take note. I get mistakes, like that's absolutely fine, but like the amount of people that just spell it with two T's because that's the most common thing, and I've just accepted it now. But when you when you messaged me, I was like, oh my god, she spelled my name right. She actually took the time to look at how to spell my name. For sure. Now, of course, we've done some stories on Instagram and people are going to be wanting to listen or watch because this will go on YouTube as well about essentially your journey from competitor to Mm -hmm. motherhood. Now, as we've already spoken about, this is going to transfer to so many people that are stepping away from competing. Now, we know and you are living proof. It's very, very difficult for a number of reasons. And, you know, like you've said, you're an open book, which is super useful because there's no point in dressing it up if we're going to actually help the listeners. And and that is going to be, you know, a a pivotal part to this episode because people actually go, Oh, you know, what can I do if I struggle with X? And I'm sure you've had sort of mental challenges, but also accepting your physique changing. Yeah. There's there's, it's, it's been a ride and I'm still definitely at the beginning of that journey. I'm still figuring it out and I'm still, getting used to the fact that my mind has changed as well as my physicality. I've briefly spoken about it on my Instagram before, like your whole identity changes. And sometimes that identity change happens faster than you accept it. Mm. So you're kind of in between a rock and a hard place where you become this new person. Like as soon as you give birth, it's instant. But you're playing catch up because you're trying to adjust to this new life as well. And I really struggled with that at the beginning. Um, And I'm still again finding my feet now but six months down the line I'm obviously in a much better place Mm. um but I think it's just again it's a massive part of pregnancy motherhood labor birth coming into this whole era that is not spoken about just like postpartum is not really spoken about everyone talks about pregnancy everyone talks about the highs of pregnancy no one talks about the lows of pregnancy no one talks about postpartum um and it's just something that I feel now I'm in it and I'm going through it Mm-hmm. how much it impacted me for someone that's mentally quite strong and how it, it massively affected me it affected my relationship it affected my mindset so to be able to have a, an outlet to be able to kind of talk about it truthfully to to give people the heads up I think because for a lot of people you can't get around it it is just it's a hormonal freak show that happens and it affects absolutely every part of your life so you do have to face it head on. But if you can be a little bit more mentally prepared for it, you can kind of acknowledge these feelings and address them rather than go, why am I being like this? Mm-hmm. Um, I guess it's like it's like PMS, but like on loads of steroids. On steroids, it's like a yeah. hundred million times. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things as well, because as you sort of touched on there, until you do it, it's like, how do you know how to deal with that? But when hormones are at play, but that also feeds into PD use, doesn't it? You know, there are compounds where you can feel very different. And I think that, you know, competitors that are listening, I don't know if, it, well, it's not spoken about enough on open platforms at times where it's like, actually, you know, what are the effects of using compounds, but also prepping, like yeah. need hormonal adjustments and when you're in it, we we are of a different mindset, aren't we? We're a little bit unhinged and you're just doing. But then it's like post-show, isn't it? Off the back of that, fuck, like you're dumped it's with... Con- it's constant. It's, it's one thing after another. And I, I feel like myself included and probably many people, when you're outside of it, you realise how much you live in denial. Yeah. And you, you don't acknowledge truthfully what happens. And I'm in a relationship with Rob, who's also a pro bodybuilder. So we the last showing that we did together we were both on prep at the same time and how I recall the situation in prep to how I recall it outside of prep now is two completely different things and I think a lot of that is denial because you don't want to succumb to the 
the negativity that is happening, whether that's in a relationship or because of PD usage and how it's altering your kind of personality, your outlook on life, your your energy, uh, your hormones. Um, and it's not until we have conversations now where we're like, do you remember when you did this? Or do you remember when you said that? And I was like, at the time, I'd be completely in denial. I wasn't like this. I wasn't like that. Whereas now I'm like, do you know what? Yeah, I was an asshole. Mm, yeah for sure and it's that acceptance and acknowledgement and I'm the same like I had never spent a long enough period out of a prep you know I was doing shorter off season etc yeah. now I'm like nearly 19 months into my longest off season yet over like 12 years and I'm like you, you know the contemplation to will I prep in the future what does that look like is my physique improved the things that yeah. we look to to, you know we're looking to improve the stage package or whatever we want to call that yeah, yeah yeah no for sure you know each time we step on stage I will ask you this did it change your life when you got your pro card obviously yes it yeah. did but I will I, I've always said this and I, I will always stand by it when I achieved my pro card it was still so the pro card in the UK scene Attaining a pro card when it was still the kind of UK BFF days was much harder. Uh, there was one a year. Um, so it was really, really hard to obtain. I uh, mine around the era when two bros were still quite new. Yep. Um, so things were a lot different then to how they are now. And truthfully, this is God's honest truth. Yes, it changed my life. But I went into that showing. It was the first time I stepped on stage and figure. Um, so I, I genuinely went in on stage thinking, I just want to just see. Because I came from bikini then I went into fitness with the, all the the gymnastic -y thing and then just due to my old injuries from dancing um I moved to figure so I went into that show with literally no expectations I know everyone says that obviously I went in to win my class that's what I wanted to do and I didn't really think about the pro card until I was stood in the overall I think there was probably about eight of us on stage and I was like wait hang on a minute this is for like the IFBB pro card and I'm standing there just like enjoying it for what it was and then it happened and I was obviously it probably took about two or three days for it to actually like sink in because it would it just wasn't top of my list because I just didn't think about it yeah. and then after that and I, I will stand by this I've always said I probably shouldn't have turned pro when I did I probably didn't deserve it I was definitely the best on a, a good day I'm not saying that the standard was bad there was loads of us Mm -hmm. um but comparatively to kind of how a figure has evolved to now I was definitely not on that level as an amateur so I probably I've always said I got very lucky and I, mean. I I felt like overwhelmed because it had happened and then I almost felt like I had to prove myself because it's all well and good kind of getting the pro card but it's what you do with that pro card and like I said, the standard now is so much harder and there's so many more competitors now and figures just going into this whole new avenue at the moment. Sure. Saying that, there's way more opportunities to get pro cards now. So a lot of people, myself included, it, it's a lot easier in the sense that there's more opportunity now. So there's more shows, there's loads more shows. Uh, some shows it's two, three pro cards in, in the overall. Mm -hmm. um, so pros and cons to it it's it's harder in one aspect but it's easier in another and I feel like because of that and because of at the time the amateur olympia that I did there was three pro cards and I came second in the overall so if there was one I wouldn't have turned pro and then I think because of that I said right this is amazing I'm grateful and I'm happy however this doesn't this is like the whole beginning now I need to prove that I'm worthy of this because I think I thought deep down that I wasn't obviously as I've relayed it now I, I've always said I was lucky and I probably shouldn't have turned pro when I turned pro. So I felt like I needed to prove myself. And I think that was the beginning of that journey. So yes, it did change my life. It was unexpected. Mm. But then I just, once it sunk in, I accepted it for what it was and then kind of worked to, to push forward into the pro scene. Mm. Well, I mean, I like what you said there about you didn't expect it and you were actually just having fun. And this is something I talk about all the time. Like you do this whole prep and then you get on stage and you see athletes and they look like they hate every fucking second of it. And that comes across with the judging for sure. Like you hit different when you're enjoying it. And it is the celebration, isn't it? Of, you know, what you've done in that prep. And I like that because hopefully people will listen and go, actually, do you know what? Because you can tip the judging from your presentation, your posing, and you may have, like you said there, there's loads of girls, you might be similar physiques, or there could be, you know, five in the top. And then it's yeah. like, actually, 
what do they want oh what I always think is what do they want to present on like their social media and and when someone's labeling I'm an IFBB pro what do they want that to look like when people are looking at IFBB you know yeah I, th I think not the problem bodybuilding has evolved into this massive it used to be taboo it used to be a very underground sport no one spoke about it no one did it my partner Rob like he he was in it in the days when no it was not cool to be a bodybuilder since social media obviously it's now very popular and it's a very popular sport and more and more people are doing it which is fantastic that's great however I think with that comes delusion and I feel like a lot of people coaches athletes just general I think whether people are feeding people bullshit or whether that's their coach their peers their their friends other athletes there's a, there's a big cloud of delusion I think at the moment and I think so many people need to have a bit of a reality check and say bodybuilding is not supposed to be a fast process mm -hmm. it's a very very time consuming slow process genetically some people are more gifted so therefore some people may achieve things faster yep. um however I think people kind of get into the sport saying I'm going to be the best in the world and that they're, they're, they're searching for that kind of pro card status immediately which Again, I, it's difficult to compare myself to that because, like I said, I wasn't really, I wasn't really focused on that ever. It, it just happened, and I feel like because it is popular now, there's so much pressure on everyone to kind of achieve a status within the industry. It it, it makes you a better coach. It makes you a better athlete. There's heaps of amateur athletes that are insane coaches, just like there's many pro athletes that are terrible coaches. So it's almost irrelevant. Um, but I feel like there's this cloud of delusion and I feel like if people could kind of see past that and be true to themselves and honest with themselves and accept bodybuilding for what it is, it's not a race. And this is across all the categories. We see it most frequently, probably with the males, because obviously they can push boundaries a lot safer than women can. Sure. Um, so you see kind of 16, 17, 18 year olds pushing stupid amounts of food drugs training they're, they're barely out of puberty and these guys are kind of chasing that pro card don't get me wrong you'll have the genetic freaks which kind of evolve very quickly they're 20 years old and they're already pro and they're amazing yeah but you get that some really young people that are just kind of you can see that they're pushing you can see how unhealthy they look and how unhealthy their mindset is and it's just it's so unfortunate that I'm that is the situation at the moment I feel like social media is probably a lot to blame for that because it is about kind of likes and validation at the moment I think many people have said this, if, if social media went down tomorrow and it was never existing ever again, who would actually still be competing? Mm -hmm. I feel like a massive handful of the industry wouldn't be because it is just a massive way to validate yourself, which it is going in it for the wrong reasons. But then, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this and I'm a competitor, but it's, it's, it's hard. It is really hard. And I, I think you have to have a really good head on your shoulders to, to embrace the journey for what it is. Um, and I feel like those that take their time are sensible in what they're doing and embrace bodybuilding for the slow progression that it is will probably not just be better bodybuilders, but they will probably sustain the healthier version of themselves for a lot longer rather than kind of dipping your toe in and getting out pretty quickly because you can't sustain what you're asking of your body. And I think that's just a message probably to to, to the younger guys and girls than it is to the, to the olders. We We have a I say we, I'm talking about myself, I'm 32. So I, I've got a lot more life experience behind me to to understand kind of the pressures of the world and society. But to, to the young people that have kind of grown up in social media, just try not to kind of fall under this cloud of delusion that everyone's kind of living under at the moment. Try and see things for what it is because the Jay Cutlers, the Ronnie Coleman's, all of these massive and crazy bodybuilders, they absolutely are genetic freaks for sure. But they probably didn't turn pro in two years and then go to the Olympia within another year after that. They probably put in their work and in their time. I just feel like, unfortunately, it's just it's getting so, so popular now, which is great for the sport. But there's only so much that can fit into that. Mm. At, we can't accommodate everyone. And I think everyone expects everything. So it's it's just you have to be clever. You have to be really kind of calculated. And that kind of would lead quite not uh, quite quite nicely into being a parent and being a mother and how that was juggled because it's something that you do have to be aware of quite early on and it's something that you have to again stay true to yourself I came into this sport in my first show was 2015 
and even then I was completely I had no idea what I was doing I basically competed with, with my mum and just followed her diet like I had no coach nothing mm -hmm. um but as the time went on and kind of by 2017 2018 I knew that things were progressing for me always in the back of my mind I knew that I wanted to be a mum so that was kind of helpful in my decision making now on in because it's something that especially with PD usage and females within this sport you, you have to be sensible you, you can't some people probably can push and then their bodies are super forgiving and it's absolutely fine but I think for the majority of us mere mortals like these decisions will impact you for the rest of your life and being a mum for me was way more important than any medal so it it was the the top of my list before I made any other choices as to what I do and mm. I think with most not all but most of the coaches that I've worked with like I'd always state that is my priority so we are going to accommodate around that and again peer pressure I think a lot of people just succumb to what their coaches tell them to do or not do whereas I was the total opposite I said no I'm not doing that or this is my line and I'm not crossing it so if that means we can't work together that's fine but I'm absolutely not crossing my line so again it's just being sensible and not rushing anything and just just being accountable for the decisions that you're making early on to whatever you want to do later on in life you don't have doesn't have to be kids it's just just general health and well-being when you're kind of coming into 40 50 as a female when you approach the menopause like there's so many things um that we've still got to cover yeah and the decisions that we make in our 20s and in our 30s and even before that potentially can affect that later on for sure when you had these conversations with coaches was there ever any backlash or was it always respected that that was your sort of expectations to be fair to everyone that I've worked with it has been pretty good I think half of that is I was just I was dead set adamant so that there, there was no option to if anyone ever did kind of say something that I didn't want to hear I'd be like I appreciate your opinion but no thank you that it, it's not a relationship that I want to work with now and I've always been quite stubborn in my my approach I'm I'm a very coachable person. I I will say yes to pretty much what any anyone asks me to do, it, I'll do it. If you want me to, like you said the other day, if you want me to eat shit off the floor, I will do that. Like if that gets me in shape, I'll do that. Yeah. However, when it comes to the drug usage, that is where I will kind of lay my lay my law. A hundred percent because I knew I wanted to be a mum. So that was just first of probably more so than my health, yeah. even though that is still part of your kind of hormonal health. But my my day to day health that probably took a secondary marker to knowing that my reproductive health was the, the most important thing to me but no I think I've been quite lucky with with people that I've worked with don't get me wrong I've done some stupid shit haven't we all or I've been told to do some stupid shit and I've probably tried it and then gone uh, that doesn't feel right well um, this is the thing isn't it it's like if something does come up and you're not sure I think that sometimes there is this depending on who your coach is and, and how you rate them right because I've spoken about this before it's like you rate them as this like authority figure so what they say you do but I still feel and I, I don't know about you but that there should be a level of not questioning but why why am I doing that for my own education 100%. you know 100%. because how do you learn and and this is this falls back to what are you getting from the sport what do you actually want do you want to just get a pro card and then live a lifestyle do you want to educate yourself do you want to be a coach yourself like there's lots of different avenues and yeah. I think that you know those informed decisions are super important but I, I don't know it depends what you're viewing that authority figure as and and that sure. can be taken for you know these authority figures sometimes there's a lot of horror stories out there I'm sure you've heard plenty yeah. it's it it literally kills my soul I'm sure you're the yeah. same it, it, it's brutal and I think again people prey on the vulnerable and I, I see it from both sides like I see why people do that because it's an easy in and it's a potential opportunity for them to not only make money but to potentially make themselves look good at the same time I appreciate lack of knowledge makes it more difficult but if someone told me to take Anabar, for example, and I had no idea what it was, I absolutely wouldn't say, okay, I just automatically would say, what is Anabar? Yeah, perfect. Like, even if you're asking the most basic of questions, and I feel like some people don't help themselves or do themselves a disservice, because maybe because of pressure, again, pressure through social media, pressure from their coach, pressure from the industry to be a certain way or to look a certain way, they just kind of say yes, and then probably think, probably shouldn't have done that. 
And I, again, I will absolutely hold my hands up. Like I've, again, everyone says they don't push gear. I genuinely have never pushed gear. Um, and I arguably probably could have waited longer than I did. I still did 15, 16, 17, four years naturally yeah. as, a, as, a, as a bodybuilder and right. two shows in that time. Um, but arguably I probably could have held on a bit longer, uh, but mine was down. Mine was purely peer, peer pressure. That, that was that was why I did it. I think the, my coach at the time was like, should we do this? I questioned it, uh, weighed up the kind of pros and cons and said yes to it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think prematurely, I, I probably should have said, no, I probably do want to feel my natural potential slightly longer. Um, but again, society, people blow smoke up my arse. You've got so much potential. Your genetics are so good. If you do this, this will happen really quickly. So I, I get it. I've been there. I, I understand what it's like to kind of get swept up in the wave of, people blowing smoke and again it's that delusion that I was talking about earlier like it, it it's so hard to to kind of see through that and maybe it is with experience that it's easier to navigate if you have less experience it probably is a lot harder to navigate because you don't really know what is what but yeah I think I mean this industry is absolutely crazy at the moment to be honest oh no, it's 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 really difficult this is where I hope from the podcast that People can listen and and hear stories, essentially, isn't it? You know, someone hears a story and they go, oh, that's similar to me. Yeah. And uh, like I say, there is a, there's a fine line between questioning if you don't trust in the coach or maybe you're not sure yeah. or asking a question. And like you said, it's a disservice to yourself to a certain degree, because actually, you know, what are you putting in your body? Also, when we talk about PDs, of course, you know, are, are they tested? Are they even the anabolic? The real thing you know, whatever it is, because I've heard people taking d bowl instead of Anima and, and various, yeah. various things. And you think, holy shit. So there, there's so many things to it, but there is also, and it's getting more and more, I believe, where people aren't being told about the side effects. If they ask about them, maybe it's sort of skirted across and it's like, no, this should yeah. be fine. Are you okay with those side effects or are you swept into the peer pressure as it were? Now, yeah. When we talk about side effects, you know from doing it naturally, I know from doing it naturally, it ain't fucking normal. What you're doing in a prep, when you're pushing foods in an off season, all of these things, this is extreme. That's why it's called an extreme sport. Again, it's like, you're so caught up. I was the same. I was like, I will do whatever it fucking yeah. takes. You know, and it's yeah. like, I, I feel like a, a coach that is talking like we do to these people in a certain way you're not undermining anyone you're just saying you know this is what it involves the truth yeah yeah and it's like if someone then wholeheartedly goes look for me it's worth it then fine but it, it is difficult I wonder if it does come with maturity like you say I, I I definitely think that has a massive role to play with it and it's again I think now being in a, in the industry when it's it's evolved as much as it has and people want things yesterday um, there, there is no patience, like I said at the beginning, and bodybuilding's turned into this, like, make as much progress as you possibly can as quickly as you can. Um, it's kind of like also then making everything a bit more wishy-washy as to kind of what is the correct thing to do. And again, I was having this conversation with my partner. We've talked about it multiple times, and he's a lot more experienced than I am in regards to bodybuilding. He's, he's achieved the same as me, but he's taken a lot longer to do it. He's done it the right way he's been in this industry I mean he's ancient now he won't mind me saying um <laughs> but the, the amount of times he's had people come up to him in the gym or approached him for online coaching or to be prepped and he's again just been brutally honest and people have said what gear should I take what should I do what should I do should I take this should I take this and he goes no don't take anything stay natural for as long as possible and people don't want to hear that so when you're kind of advising the healthier thing to do, I think a lot of people go, that's not what I want to hear. I'm going to go and look elsewhere to someone that will tell me what I want to hear. And again, I think that's also a, a problem of people just want things now and they, they don't understand that the longevity in this sport is down to the decisions that you make now. That's why Rob's 41 years old and he's still, he's in the best shape he's ever been in. And he's not regressing yet. He's, he's if anything, he's getting better. And it's just those decisions that he's made and his approach to the whole process is very old school. It's what they used to do. Uh, and he he kind of like doesn't like this new school bodybuilding era that we're in because he says everyone's just so impatient. Everyone just expects everything now. And it, it that's not the point of this sport. The whole point of this sport is to to take it slow. 
but again i i massively think social media has a lot to lot to say for that yeah it is it's, what is social media a highlight reel so it's like oh i could be a bodybuilder and then suddenly you're associating with bodybuilders and you, you get caught on this rabbit wheel of oh my god you know everyone i know is a bodybuilder and i always reference this it's like you follow bodybuilders but there's only a small percentage of people that actually compete when we look at the whole seven billion people in the world and then it's like yeah. sometimes we need a bit of context there how did he find when you were looking at getting pregnant and did he have to make changes as well for his own PDs, etc.? No. Okay, cool. Again, I think that boils down to sensible decisions on both parts. We both took time to investigate to make sure things were okay before. We were trying. Hang on. We weren't trying. We were, we were not not trying, we were if that makes sense. But we were on the fence. <laughs> we, we were, yeah, we were just kind of doing things in life. And if it happened, it happened. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, so... We like both last competed at the back end of 22. And that that was the year when I said I would like to potentially start a family next year. And we sat down and had a conversation and we both agreed like, yeah, OK, we need to sort our shit out and then we can kind of see what happens. I think I fell pregnant really quickly. Um, again, I advocate that to sensible choices and looking after myself. So I finished competing in November and I was pregnant by the January unfortunately that pregnancy ended in miscarriage so that then I think I miscarried at was it six weeks so naturally I think as a female that goes through something like that you immediately blame yourself it, it's my fault something I've done is wrong and I think again naturally my circumstances I assumed that I probably hadn't had long enough away from or hadn't had long enough to recover and I got very lucky mm. um, and I kind of blamed that I think it's impossible to say why I think some obviously some situations you can find a solution but yeah. it's so common to miscarry I think that's a massive it's something that I've learned I didn't realize how common it was and it it could be for absolute no reason whatsoever just it wasn't viable and sometimes it's for the best because if that does kind of become viable and that does lead into kind of a pregnancy and a, a child there potentially could be something wrong or something amiss during that kind of sperm egg yeah. fertilization process so that could be problems later on so sometimes they are blessings in disguise but it doesn't make them any easier mm. um so we lost baby um and then that was when we both said maybe it is what we've done and the sport that we've chosen to do maybe that does have anything to do with it and so we looked into our hormones more extensively um and we specifically looked into obviously our reproductive hormones yeah. everything came back fine so that it was just again an unlucky number and that that wasn't supposed to be again I fell pregnant really quickly after that as well so I had I had one period and then I fell pregnant so things happened very very quick yeah. um again I still advocate that to being sensible and kind of nourishing myself looking after myself knowing what was where and the same with Rob so he's again every, everyone says it he's also a bodybuilder that uh, it's just very tentative. He he doesn't, he's genetically gifted as well. So, I mean, his legs are unreal. The upper body's not so gifted as his legs. So he's had to work hard there. But again, his his choice of, his choices have been that of the result of knowing that at some point he will want to be a dad. So he's never really, I think he's obviously when he was younger, he maybe pushed a little bit. But as he's kind of matured into the sport um, and found his feet, it it was just, he he knew his body was fine his hormones were fine and again just regularly checking that whether you're off season or on prep just just staying on top of your blood work staying on top of your recovery post show and throughout the year to be honest it's it's not just that you do your bloods before you do a prep and you do a bloods post show like you do need to stay on top of it to to kind of make sure that your off season is not affecting anything so we did check but that was because of what happened with our miscarriage. And I think that was just, we wanted an explanation, if anything else. And we just knew it wasn't us. It's nothing that we did. Mm. And something that I will say that I was told is taking PDs and taking these things. Yes, it absolutely can affect your ability to be fertile, but it doesn't affect what happens once you fertilize an egg. So it doesn't affect your DNA. It doesn't change your DNA. So your DNA is your DNA. If there's something wrong with the fetus or the baby, that's not because of the bodybuilding choices that you've made. It That is because of something that with your or with his DNA profile, that's what's caused that problem. Because again, I was like, have the drugs made 
what if, what if there's something wrong with the baby? I'll go into detail in a minute, but with Bertie, um, at about, I can't remember how many weeks it was, you basically get um, blood tested for things like Down syndrome and stuff. And he came back as a red flag. And again, I think I went through that thinking, this is what I've chosen. This is my lifestyle. This is what's potentially caused this. And they reassured me that it's absolutely not. It, it's purely down to your DNA. And these drugs don't alter your DNA. Mm. Um, they just obviously change your hormones. Um, so things like that. And I've had a couple of girls reach out to me to to say, like, are my choices in bodybuilding going to affect the my baby? Is there going to be something wrong with them? And the answer is no, mm. it, they won't. Unless there's something wrong or different in your DNA, but the drugs that you've taken will not change that. Mm. That's just what you were born with. That's super cool, actually, that insight, because it's not something I guess you, you like you say, you're racking your brains. It, is it something I've done or is there something wrong? I mean, I can never imagine how that feels to have that red flag because it's something that people talk about, isn't it? But until it actually happens to you. You never think it happens to you either. And I think it was I mean, I'll just briefly talk about it. So you, yeah. you have this routine blood test when you're I can't remember how many weeks pregnant you are. I feel like it's between it's, it's def- so 12 weeks is when you get your first scan yeah. and then your gender scans at 20 weeks and it, I think it's around the 16 weeks so it's in the middle of in the middle of those and you basically go for a routine test and they test for things like down syndrome some other birth defects that can happen it, it's a routine thing and that was what came back my number was on the so again I, I should have looked into this in detail you it's get just, kind of like okay. a borderline of numbers and mine was right on the borderline so it wasn't particularly low but it was on the line where they said we need to investigate a little bit more to kind of reassure you and us that we we there is or isn't a problem mm. um and that initial blood test is taken from the mother's hormones so they say it's not the most accurate pull it's not the most accurate test to know if there is something wrong or a chromosomal chromosome was that the right word mm-hmm abnormality and um, so that's when they kind of if you are in that borderline or below it they will then investigate with a further blood test which is then looking at the dna of the of the baby it can then go one step further if that comes back as a red flag as well um but you do need to kind of meet those borderlines again through the nhs in the uk i think if if you're not in those kind of borderline areas they don't want to spend the money to to investigate so you can opt to do that privately but I, I've said, again, in hindsight now, it was probably a blessing that we were in that kind of borderline category because it then allowed us for then more investigation to know that we were we were fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's useful to learn about these things, isn't it? Because like you say, you've had people reach out and it's like, you wouldn't ordinarily know that, that PDs yeah. don't affect the DNA. It's not something I've come across before. Yeah, no, I think I think it's it's just one of those things that we know it's it's bad for you and we know it affects your fertility. So you can become infertile from your te- your usage. Yeah. Um, but no, it doesn't then affect kind of your DNA Won't structure. Um, yeah, it, that, that's got nothing to do with it. So when you started that second time round after the miscarriage, were you, was it almost like a, you just want to try again straight away? Or did you have a period of, of almost grief and, and how you dealt with that? I think it was a, a probably a combination of both. I think you, you go through that kind of heartbreak of this is what could have been. And then you are grieving and it, it it's crazy. It's again, it's not until you go through it that you mm. you feel it. But you it is a death and you you are allowed to acknowledge the death, even though that that person wasn't alive outside of the womb. They were still a being with a heartbeat inside of you. Mm. Um so I I massively was grieving. I mean, I was probably like a week in bed, like beside myself upset. And that, that was just how I dealt with it. Um, again, being something that I so desperately wanted and it was taken away from you, like it, it's really hard to cope with. And then I think it was, yeah, a combination of both. You are grieving. And for a lot of people, they probably don't want to try for a while because they don't want to run the risk of the heartbreak again. But at the same time, it's like if you fall off a bike, just get straight back on. Like just keep keep trying because it can happen. And there was nothing that was amiss. There was nothing that wrong that we did. It was just an unlucky number. We continue to not try hard, but like, I didn't check my ovulation. I didn't look into anything like that. We just did did the deed when we did the deed and just hope for the best. And it, it happened quite organically as well. Mm-hmm. That probably, again, helped. I think many, many women out there, they really struggle to conceive. And I can't resonate with that because I've been so fortunate that it's happened very quickly and very naturally for us. Mm. So I can't imagine how devastating and heart wrenching it is when you do have to kind of go out of your way to 
to try and make the stars aligned for this to happen. But something that I will say, if anyone is out there, they are trying to conceive as much as you can try and relax on it. Try not to overthink it. Try not to stress about it because that will inhibit it happening. It will massively affect um, the outcome in which you so desperately want. So as much as you can, obviously there is a time and a place. Some people do need to check when they're ovulating. You do need to kind of look into these kind of things, but just try and enjoy the process as much as you can rather than kind of get your heart dead set on it has to happen right now because unfortunately the body works in weird and wonderful ways and the more pressure you put on yourself the higher your cortisol is going to be it's the same with bodybuilding I know I'm just thinking this it's literally like you just want to kind of be in the most zen atmosphere as possible but again I know what it's like when you desperately want something and it, it, it's not happening and it is a vicious circle. The more you want something, the more it's not happening, the more you get stressed about it. So my advice to everyone is just try and enjoy the process of trying to conceive rather than kind of follow all these forums and these pages on these apps and getting so dead set on it has to happen. It's going to be this one. It's going to be this one. It, it will happen if it is meant to happen and it won't if it's not meant to. And if it doesn't happen, there are so many things you can do now. Yeah. Um, I know it's probably not people's first choice, but there's so many different avenues to be able to have children. So just try and take one step at a time and just embrace the journey for what it is. Mm, yeah, for sure. There's there's so many correlations to bodybuilding in itself. It's like it is crazy. It's weak, chill the fuck out. <laughs> yeah, literally exactly the same. Don't eat like an asshole. Don't train too hard. Relax. Keep it chilled. No leg days. <laughs> yeah, no leg days. No intense exercise. And did you find when you did conceive the second time, was there that reservation in the back of your mind? Could 100%. Make... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I absolutely for the for those first initial 12 weeks, I I couldn't sleep properly. I couldn't I, I wrapped myself in cotton wool is what I did. So with the first one, um, like I said, we we lost him or her at six weeks. Up until that six weeks, I think I found out I was pregnant around the four weeks mark. So around when my period was due, I, I, I instinctively knew. So for the two weeks after that, I didn't really change a lot. I was just a bit more, obviously in the gym, I was just a little bit more tentative, but I still went balls to wall. Like I still, I didn't really tra change my training. I just took some additional kind of prenatal supplements and stuff just to make sure that I was getting enough of the vitamins and stuff that I needed. And then I think after the miscarriage, when we got pregnant again, I, like I said, I absolutely wrapped myself in cotton wool. I didn't go to the gym. Granted, this time I had morning sickness. Um, so that was fun. And we also went to Mexico when I was, I think it was about six, seven weeks. So about the time we miscarried, just it was conveniently, it happened to be that around that time that we went. I think that probably helped because we were away for two weeks. And although I was silly things, like I don't want to jump in the pool in case it like falls out or I don't want to do this and I don't, I couldn't drink and all these kind of things. But it was nice to kind of be away from the world here and routine to just try and kind of enjoy it. And that's what we did. And by the time I came back, I was nine weeks. And then when you get to that 12 week mark and you get your first scan and everything's touch wood fine that's when you can just take a bit of a breath it's still not clear um you're still not like in the safe there is no safe zone in pregnancy everyone says 12 weeks is the safe zone it's definitely th the first 12 weeks is the most common chance to miscarry so that's why it's called the safe zone so you get to the 12 week mark you can take a little bit of a breath and then like I said we come into that kind of chromosomal abnormality peaked up at kind of 15 16 weeks so then we had to go through that turmoil that was really stressful and heart-wrenchingly difficult to go through you come through that and then you've got your 20-week scan which is the gender scan which we were just arguing about for weeks because he didn't want to find out I was desperate to know what we were having so that that happens and then kind of after that you I don't know I think it's kind of you, you see by the 20-week scan you're halfway so you're when you see that scan and you see your baby he was pretty developed like it looks like an actual baby now so although anything can still happen I think once you see and you can hear the heartbeat and you kind of get that reassurance that everything's okay you you do kind of just forget that bad things can happen to you and you just embrace the rest of your pregnancy thinking about that now and I've said that probably to do with the second trimester as well the first trimester is rough well I had a bit of a rough time um, so hormonally, that's where the big changes start to happen, which is why you feel shit. Yeah. Then 20 weeks, you're in your second trimester and you do tend to flourish then because things tend to settle and it tends to be the best part of your pregnancy. So maybe mentally as well, everything's settled a little bit more. The dust has settled. So you do 
mentally just naturally enjoy it a bit more rather than panic and worry i'm sure there are people that just probably worry from beginning to end for sure but no i i tend to by that by that and second scan i was like right i can kind of i'm in the swing of it now i'm used to being pregnant now i've accepted it now i've i've met him i know it's a him um so you just kind of enjoy the bit of the process until you get to the third trimester and then everything just goes a bit shit again yeah also i always think you know like what must that feel like having that baby there like it's just honestly the most weirdest special feeling in the world it, it's it's crazy i think initially you don't obviously you don't feel any as a first time mum as well as you have more children you start feeling things a lot earlier mm. so i didn't feel anything until i was probably about 22 23 weeks pregnant mm. didn't feel anything at all um, obviously the bump has grown I probably started showing at about 16 weeks but we're talking kind of I look bloated like to, to anyone else they wouldn't be able to tell bodybuilding bloated yeah 100% <laughs> I've, I've probably had far too much gluten kind of bloated <laughs> holding water um, guys <laughs> yeah 100% um, so by about the 20 week scan when we found out the gender I started to look more than bloated and then like I said a couple of weeks after that was when you started feeling things and it, it's crazy because it's it literally feels like popping, like bubbling. Like, you know, like when your tummy rumbles, kind of like gurgly, bubbly, that's what it feels like initially. And you're like, do I need a poo or is that baby? Like, I, I don't know if that's my digestion. Mm. Um, and then obviously as the weeks go on, they get more and more. And then by kind of 30 weeks plus, you're like, please stop touching me. Please stop kicking me because it just fucking hurts now. Right in the rib cage, right on the bladder. So it's lovely to begin with. But then after a while, you're like, please just remove child from my uterus I just want to see my bit I always think I'd be like nobody you touch really. bump constantly <laughs> you do touch a bump constantly <laughs> you do but again then you get to a point where it becomes it, it the novelty wears off and I'd like sit on the sofa with my teacup just like on my bump like he was just my tray um was and I'd sit protective? yes probably more so initially I think naturally when things were difficult and we were worried and um, but after a while, he, he, especially when I got bigger, he didn't like me traveling. Um, so we're based in Leicester and my family are right down south and his family are a bit more, more north. So any traveling that we did and I was driving, he really didn't like it. And at the time we had a smart car. I mean, we still do have a smart car. Um, so this tiny little danger vehicle, um, which he was like, please don't drive that car. But I think as well, as you get bigger, like you get way more tired. Obviously, you just it's honestly a whole thing it's a whole thing I think back now we're talking about like at some point soonish having a second and I was like I don't know if I could do that yet I don't like know if row, isn't it? <laughs> you need to like mentally recover from it for then to to get back into it as well um, but yes he, he was quite protective he allowed me to obviously do things he wasn't kind of extreme protective where he was like you can't do anything you must sit and do nothing yeah. But he would carry all the heavy bags and he would, he would, I mean, I'm not complaining. It means I don't have to carry it. So mm. it's funny as well, isn't it? I think that sometimes like it sounds like you guys, I never want to assume, but it sounds like you guys are a pretty strong unit, the two of you. And, and I have this with my partner who I've been with only just over two years and previous relationships very different. And there, you know, he, he will say to me, if he sees my back's pulling or something, he'd be like, should you be doing that? And it's from a place of, care and I, I feel like he'd probably be quite similar in a pregnancy like yeah. I'll do that and it's not seen as like they're undermining you it's like actually they they, they just want to help you you know yeah a hundred percent and I think when you're in that position as a pregnant female and you are competent and you're still fine and you can still kind of like mid-pregnancy when you're still absolutely fine but you're showing I think again because of how you look it's really easy to think they need help Whereas you're actually fine. It's not until you get to the back end, the last 10 weeks when things start getting difficult and you will accept the help and you will take that seat when someone gives you a seat. But I think a lot of it is just kind of your visual appearance. I think men who don't, especially men who don't understand and will never go through it, they will always probably sometimes err on the side of overprotective than allowing you to just kind of be, I mean, some people might not, but I think generally people probably are a little bit overprotective, but I, I get it. I do get it. Mm, for sure I love your your photo of you doing a check-in with Bump because it'd be interesting to talk to you about what that was like stepping away from doing you know in in when in the bodybuilding lifestyles it were whatever phase you're in you're checking in every week you're told what food to have you're told what training to do etc yeah. I think that that's probably the transition that would be so unique to motherhood because it's like 
so where where's that purpose you know it's, it's a bit of a limbo isn't it yeah th those check-ins that I did were purely they they weren't to, to the ground <laughs> it was, yeah it, it was purely to kind of it was something that I could compare to and I could kind of look back and go wow like that's incredible and it was just almost a bit of a play on on the mm. whole bodybuilding thing mm. something that I will say is your body massively changes and that is really hard and again I was very fortunate I'm I don't know if it's genetics or whatever it was I didn't my physicality hasn't really altered that much I was very lucky I didn't get any stretch marks so I had a pretty easy pregnancy in the sense that my body handled it quite well you, you bounce back we'll talk about that in a minute so again I'm coming at this from a place of I didn't have a bad time with it however mentally it's when you see your growing tummy it's the best feeling in the world but from a competitor standpoint you're just like holy shit yeah holy shit yeah. um obviously childbearing so it's not just your stomach that changes your hips change as well and that's something that's probably stayed at the moment i'm still only six months down the line that's still not changed yeah. so your whole pelvic girdle opens so your 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 hips appear wider so your your actual body shape changes I don't think it's permanent. I, I couldn't be quoted on that. I don't know. I think things do tend to go back to where they were. But because your skeleton moves, your rib cage moves, your pelvis moves, and that's all just to accommodate, obviously, a growing bump. It is really difficult. The bump's lovely. You, you do love your bump and you embrace having a big tummy because it's not a fat tummy. It's, it's a, a baby tummy. But things like muscle atrophy. So that's probably to do with not consistent training slash I didn't train for the first 12 weeks so naturally you're going to accrue loss of tissue diet obviously I did not eat like a bodybuilder when I was pregnant I just kind of ate to satiate myself and how I was feeling especially when you have morning sickness like you you can't think about chicken and rice for most people you are just kind of eating to accommodate some kind of nutrition going inside of your body mine was rich teas that that's what got me through a cup of tea um, yeah, literally dunking teas into my uh, rich teas into my tea. Um, but yeah, it, it is difficult. And I think when you come from a sport or a background where it, it's all about your aesthetic, it is a tough pill to swallow. But you I think in pregnancy, it's easier because you just accept it for what it is. And you, you know what you're doing is a miracle. And it's an amazing process. And I, I thoroughly loved my pregnant body, even if it wasn't kind of my ideal physique. I enjoyed being pregnant. I enjoyed my bump. I loved how I looked. Um, the glow that you get, the harder part is postpartum. Now, that's where it's mm -hmm. really difficult. Your body is not your body. It, it's, it's that of someone else. And like I said, I preface that with I didn't even have a bad time with it. Like I'm, I'm still very fortunate. However, it still affects me. And I'm sure a lot of people are a lot worse especially if you're carrying multiples things are twice as bad and some people genetically they can bounce back so you do see it on again on social media and it's always the people that have bounced back super quickly but that is down to their genetics that is because they are destined to kind of be a certain way my mum was one of those people if anything after she had all three of us there's three of us um she got slimmer and slimmer every time so she and she didn't try hard that that is just what her body did i'm at the moment content with how I look I've accepted it like I said my hips are still wider my pelvis still hasn't gone back to its pre-pregnancy state so that's kind of taken a bit of adjustment because I've always had like tiny waist tiny hips and now my hips are not the smallest part of me the skin that's a lot to deal with again I'm quite fortunate that my skin's okay um, it's still soft you still get that they call it mummy tummy so like if you just like rub your tummy like that the skin's soft it's not necessarily fat yeah. Um, but the, the skin, the elasticity of your skin has stretched. So naturally that yeah. has then needs time to kind of go back to probably not how it was, but to a, a level of is acceptable. Yeah. And that that's been probably the hardest challenge. Again, breasts, that's another area. Um, mm -hmm. I'm enhanced. I have yeah, me breast, too. breasticles. <laughs> me too. Um, so for people like me and you, it's not as bad. Yeah. Um, mine have definitely dropped slightly because when your milk comes in, oh my goodness, when your milk comes in, what we need to take we know we need to take a moment to address this situation. So yeah, I, sit, in the room. I sit at a double D with my <laughs> breast implants. I'm a double D naturally. 
two, three days after you give birth, your body goes, we need to produce milk now, bitch. So your milk comes in. One, it's the most painful thing in the world because you get like, it's called engorge and your tits literally just go like bricks. They're fucking hard. Guess what size my cup went to from a double oh, day? Stop. We're talking a week. This I happened in a week. Double E, but... A double H. Oh my God. My tits were massive. I was like, no, no, this cannot be happening. And Why do I get a breast augmentation? It's honestly shocking at how big they get. And does that, this, did you breastfeed? I didn't breastfeed for long because we struggled to breastfeed. Um, so I, again, when we stopped, that kind of went back to normal, probably within a few days. So that engorgement and that milk supply depleted quite quickly. So we did go back to kind of normal, normal boobage. Um, I believe if you do breastfeed, um, obviously they stay fuller, but the engorgement of the breast goes down. So that is just the process of the milk. So you, you produce colostrum, which is like a thick, creamy yeah. substance when you're pregnant. And once your placenta is removed from your body, so you give birth to your placenta, once your body recognises that there is no baby inside of you anymore, that's when your hormones then produce the milk, which is why it happens two to three days after you give birth. So you engorge initially. So that's where you just get like this tsunami no. of just breast milk. And it's a whole thing. So anyone that's pregnant, mentally prepare yourself for that. Because that was probably the worst part. I was like, why are my tits massive? Yeah. Um, Rob's like... <laughs> not in, no, because they were square. They weren't even like normal. They were. I've squeezed them into a double deep bra. I'm leaving <laughs> milk everywhere. It's not sexy. You're literally under your chin. There's red raw to touch. You're breastfeeding, so your nipples feel like someone's just like mm -hmm. sucking on your nipples, and that really hurts. Yeah. It's the, absolutely not the most sexiest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, ladies, that part that happens quite quickly. So just prepare yourself for that. But it does go down. It does go down, whether you breastfeed or not. I think if you're breastfeeding, obviously they stay fuller because you do have a milk supply there, mm. um, but not to the extent where you're kind of like five million cup sizes bigger than you were. Yeah. But that was the thing that was that traumatized me. Yeah. And how was the pregnancy? Pregnancy, um, again, I enjoyed most of it. I did, I thought, being how desperate I wanted to have kids, I thought I love pregnancy and it's going to be amazing. It is hard. It is really hard. Mm. So the initial part, the initial 12 weeks, like I said, your your hormones are doing weird and wonderful things. So everything's kind of surged. Your pregnancy hormones, your HCG hormone, that is mass. That's I think it doubles every other day or something. So it's rapidly multiplying. So that comes with morning sickness, not for everyone. And some people get it really bad and they are hospitalized. Yeah. I thankfully only got morning sickness probably from six weeks till about probably about 12. So for about five, six weeks, it was easier to handle at the back end of that. Initially, it was the first couple of weeks I was like, and you just can't eat anything. You just when you don't eat, you feel worse. So you have to kind of force it. That's where the biscuits came in. You force feed yourself. Um, well, you're used to it as well as a bodybuilder. This is what I say when people are like on holiday or something like this. I say to my clients, like, try and think about what you normally have and, and get close to that in some proximity and like hydration and stuff. Cause yeah. we're so used to day in, day out hitting the targets. And then the, the mind knows what's happening, but the body can sometimes like, you can feel like shit, can't you? If you're not, yeah, it's, 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 it's really hard if, if you do suffer with it. And th that would be a little tip is when you wake and you are suffering from morning sickness, try and eat something that is plain. So a lot of people say crackers because it's that mm. you can get them in. Um, you don't need many. Rich teas was my go-to. You don't need many. It is literally two or three. And it just staves off that sickness from kind of peaking. And it's manageable. But definitely something that I notice is if you're experiencing morning sickness and you feel that wave of nausea and you don't eat anything, it gets 100 times worse as the day goes on. So you are absolutely, first thing in the morning, just force it in. If it's a couple of crackers or something dry, something plain, um, and it does massively help. So that's just a little tip for, for any pregnant mamas out there. But the first first trimester was it had its challenges because that's where everything's changing, surging. Probably physically is hard, um, in the sense that your hormones. Well. With the of, hormones, was it around? Did you feel like sore boobs and and that type of thing as well? Was... My boobs definitely hurt, but again, not too dissimilar from a period kind of painful. They they weren't that bad. One thing that I did have actually, which was very bizarre, it's called. 
obviously I can't remember what it's called. It's basically like hay fever symptoms, but like really bad. I thought it was hay fever initially because I was like so bunged up. Um, my eyes were streaming. I couldn't breathe. And I had to, I even had to like wear nose strips to like open up my airways because it was that bad. And I slept in them. And I, again, stupidly at the time of the year, it was kind of March, April tree pollen. I just assumed it was that. And it lasted pretty much the whole trimester. So it was kind of 12 weeks of hay fever symptoms. Um, but it is actually something related to pregnancy. Um, oh, I might remember what it's called in a minute, but I can't at the moment. Uh, so that was probably my worst symptom. That was my worst thing to contend with. Like I said, by 12 weeks, that cleared up. And generally your second trimester, so from 12 weeks to 24 weeks, you do tend to flourish a bit more. Your hair kind of starts to grow, um, your skin, your nails, everything gets a bit better. Your hormones settle, you feel mentally better. Your body's growing nice and steady. So you can enjoy that process. And then when you get to the third, it's physically, again, really challenging. When your baby's kind of close to full term, um, it's a lot of weight to carry around. Like you've got to think, Bertie was seven and a half pounds, just baby. You're carrying kind of a placenta, which is about two pounds. You've got a litre of amniotic fluid, um, obviously extra water, inflammation, your your skeleton, like I said, your skeleton changes. So that that's quite gruesome. That's quite painful when you kind of get your pelvic girdle pain. So when your pelvis starts to open to prepare for childbirth, uh, your rib cages move to accommodate the growing uterus as it comes up. So things like heartburn, I really suffered with heartburn. That was really bad. Yeah. Um, pretty much from the moment you wake up, as soon as you eat a morsel of food, it's like, <clears throat> so that was brutal. You pee, it's worse than a prep. <laughs> it's worse than a prep. So your uterus, especially when you've got a significant baby when it's of size, is literally sat on your bladder. So mm. your bladder is permanently compressed so you constantly need a wee and obviously as baby gets bigger that is more compressed and then when they start kicking you that's when you kind of wee yourself sometimes so that can happen you get like oh I've laughed and a bit of wee's come out incontinent so heartburn was probably the the biggest symptom for me in the third and just general fatigue by that point because I mean nine months is such a long time we know what prep's like when you prep for six months and that's yeah. exhausting yeah. But carrying this and growing this for nine months, I think, again, it's underestimated how amazing the female body can be. And all of this, like you're making eyeballs, yeah. you're making eyeballs and a heart and some lungs. And you're just casually sat on the sofa like I'm making eyeballs right now. So you can feed me. It is the most wonderful, magical thing. But it, it, it it's, it's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge. And that was just my experience. Some people absolutely breeze through it mm. and love every minute of it. Some people hate it from the day dot. I know my sister, she won't mind me saying she didn't love her pregnancies. So it's just everyone's symptoms will, will be different. And it's just, again, how you mentally kind of approach that and just see the end goal. Just again, like competition prep, just make sure you kind of see and envision what's going to happen at the end and just embrace the lows and enjoy the highs because you will get days where you feel fantastic. Mm. Um, not to mention that when you do kind of blossom, the amount of people that stop you and they say oh you look amazing you're you're this you're that yeah you're um what's 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 they always you're say? glowing glowing yes that's the one you're glowing and pregnancy glow is a thing it honestly is a thing your skin and your hair and your nails like and then postpartum it all falls out and you're like, so, no. yeah you just look like a haggard witch with sleep deprivation on steroids as well because you just don't remember what baby. sleep is my baby i love you yeah, That's so enjoy like it. Name. But I know, I know. He's got an old man's name and we love it. So he's, he, I mean, I'm sure most people know. He's Albert. That's his full name. But I, I just, Bertie is just my favourite name in the world. Oh. So we gave him like a very traditional name. Yeah. Um, and we pretty much named him uh, probably about 20 minutes after we found out he was a boy. Because obviously when you're pregnant, you do discuss names anyway. So it was, it was already up there with, with what we wanted. But yeah, he was named pretty much straight away and it didn't really change. We knew we knew what he was going to be called the whole way. And then obviously childbirth. Yeah. So did you feel did you feel like anxious or worried about that? Or are you quite? Mm, I'm just I'm generally quite relaxed anyway. Um, I do. I had a little anxiety. I'm I have low key anxiety about random things just generally. Uh, nothing crazy, nothing like serious, but random things will give me a bit of anxiety. I was fine probably until when you're considered full term. So 37, 38 weeks when you know that anything can happen now was when you start actually thinking, shit, I actually have to 
exit this child through my vagina. Oh, Those right. thoughts tend to. Yeah. But also at the same time, by that point, you're like, please exit my vagina as quickly as humanly possible, because this is annoying and painful now. So, yeah, you, you do kind of think about it. And I, I, I'm sure many, especially first time mums, I read as much as I possibly could. One mm. thing I will say, ladies, nothing you read will ever, ever prepare you for what is childbirth. Oh, my goodness. It is the best, most painful thing you will <laughs> ever go through. Honestly, I, I thought I was, I thought, I mean, I'll briefly tell you. So I went into labour on the Sunday evening, um, literally got ready for bed. And this was probably like 10, 30, 11 at night. Went to the toilet, had my wee, brushed my teeth and my TMI, mucus plug came out. Um, so that was like, oh, and I had no symptoms up until this point. So I was like, I think that's my mucus plug. That has to be my mucus plug. Otherwise, I don't know what that is. There's an alien. Um, yeah, <laughs> just like some stuff is coming out of me. So I passed that at about 11 p.m. And then pretty soon after that, the, the mild contractions start. And when I say mild, it is literally like period pains, like absolutely bearable. Um, so I went to bed that night. I think I had a pretty restful sleep because I don't remember. I wake up a million times to wee because that's just standard by that point. But I don't recall being in pain. So I got through the evening, got through the night, I woke up the next morning and they were noticeably more intense, but still absolutely manageable. I... I called the hospital that morning and I said, look, I'm in labour. I'm absolutely fine. I'm just calling you to kind of say I'm in labour. I don't know how long, but I will be in at some point. <laughs> Love that. They say to you, um, how's baby's movements? And now this is, again, with hindsight and potentially this may help other people. So when you go into labour, obviously your uterus is contracting. Mm -hmm. So naturally you're distracted by how much your baby's moving because you're focused on the uterine contractions. So I said to them on the phone, I haven't really taken that much notice. I can feel him, but it's not the same. And you're probably just more overwhelmed with the, the contraction of the uterus. But they, again, kudos to the NHS, err on the side of caution. They said, you're going to come in because we need to monitor baby just to make sure everything's fine because you have just specified that it's not as it was. Yeah. So we ended up going in. Long story short, everything was absolutely fine. They gave me a stretch and sweep. A little visual for everyone there. You gotta watch it, on uh, this bit. <laughs> yeah, you've got to go on YouTube for that bit because that's literally what they do. Um, stretch and sweep, and they said, We need to book you in for an induction because you're two days overdue. And I was like, But I'm in labor, so surely he's gonna be coming soon. They said it could be your labor could stop, but because you're over and it's your first child, we do need to book one in if you want to, so we can get the ball rolling. So I didn't want to, I knew it was going to happen naturally, but I just said yes and booked it in. I think it was like two days later just to shut them up. Yeah. So I booked that in, came home, and then we went out for breakfast. By this point, it was like midday. And uh, by the time we got to breakfast, I was like, oh, that stretch and sweeps worked. And I was like, to the point where I had to pause eating when my contraction was coming. So I'd be sit there, like eat my jacket potato, and then I was like, okay, I need to you need to you know when you're in pain and you need to concentrate yeah it's that you need to breathe through it and you need to kind of focus but still manageable don't need painkillers nothing yet mm. got home and then we had this bet with my mum was with us with my mum and rob and we're like what time do you reckon we'll be going into hospital because it's progressing now quite quickly and uh i said 7 p.m i think it was i think rob predicted like later my mum predicted earlier and my goodness how quickly that went i was like sorry I forgot to mention on my stretch and sweep check in the morning I was two already two to three centimeters dilated oh that's what they told me so by the time this has come around we're kind of looking at 2 p.m 3 p.m now and I'm hunched over the windowsill if anyone fucking speaks words I will shoot them I need to fully concentrate now because this is fucking painful um making the weirdest noises like the pregnancy labor noises the hum like it's just automatic you can't help it I had candles on I was thinking zen I need some zen I need some sense um, and by this point it was like I think I'm gonna have to go in now because I need some assistance in regards to painkillers yeah. um so I called them and they said yeah come on in if you're struggling again I'll preface this I think I'm Wonder Woman and I said to myself that I'm not going to have any painkillers in this pregnant uh, in this labor. <laughs> so I've gone in going, I'll have a bit of gas and air. That's what I'm going to have. Um, so I went in. The amount of pain that I was in by this point comparatively to the morning was night and day different. 
Mm. So I'm thinking I must be six, seven centimeters. Has to be. There's no chance that I haven't dilated. You're only two to three centimeters. I'm like, how is that physically possible? There's how? So <laughs> how has nothing changed? And my vagina is on fire. Yeah. Um, so they were like, unfortunately, because you're still not four centimeters, which is active labor, they let me stay. Um, but they said, we can't give you anything apart from paracetamol at the moment. You can't even have gas in air. I was like, I'll take the paracetamol. We all know paracetamol does absolutely sweet fuck all, but you take it anyway. So they gave me two measly little paracetamols, which I popped. Oh. Um, and then probably a couple of hours later, they offered me the gas in air. They didn't check, but they offered me the gas in air. Um, I think I had about two puffs and I immediately was sick. So I was like, absolutely no chance. I'm not having that because I was just vomiting everywhere. And then, yeah, it goes on. He His heart rate kept dropping. So there was kind of cause for concern at one point. They were talking about having a C-section, emergency C-section, if things don't improve. So, but you're so oblivious by this point. Like you are in fucking la la land because the pain is on two paracetamol unbearable so you're just not even listening to what anyone's saying to you i was weeing myself i it was just it was a whole thing I, I think that was a combinations of waters breaking i was stood for labor i stood up oh did um, you yeah i couldn't sit down it was far too painful i needed to kind of like move and like move around they were like sit on this medicine ball i was like absolutely fucking not like i need space i need air so like um, literally like starfishing um, so waters are breaking. God knows what other fluids coming out of me. It was just the most not elegant thing. I was vomiting. It was just really not a pretty sight. Poor Rob's traumatized in the back. He's just sat there with his meal prep, like, <laughs> like not a clue what to do with himself because anything he did, I would probably bite his head off anyway. But it's just the pain that you're in. It's just you. You don't want anything. Um, and then transpires that he was fine. I had to have an episiotomy. <clears throat> so that is for people that don't know is when they snip. So instead of tearing, they choose to selectively snip you towards your butt yeah. um, to open out because they said my pelvic floor was too strong and I kept sucking his head back in. So yeah. I'll take that as a compliment. This is a thing, actually. I've heard this now, not an, a nice story at all, but I actually, my many, many moons ago when I worked at the gym, my manager, his girlfriend kept having miscarriages because her abdominal wall was too strong. And yeah. they said, you need to, like, stop training abs, basically. Um, yeah, similar type. Yeah, of yeah they said your pelvic floor, mu your muscle's too thick. So mm -hmm. it's so strong that the contraction is just sucking his head back in. So they needed to kind of snip that. Again, you're totally oblivious by this point. Um, Snip the fucking thing. You're you're in so much pain. Like you don't need any extra painkillers. Like you, I've got my two paracetamol. That's plenty for me. Thank you. Um, cut me up. Get this baby out. Eventually, he birthed him. So by the time I started pushing, it was forty minutes. So it's pretty quick. Um, he came out, and then just for a bit of dramatic effect, I hemorrhaged at the end. Oh, did and, you? Yeah, we lost quite a lot of blood at the end. And again, I didn't see it, but I could just see Rob go white. Yeah. He was like, it was the most magical experience in the world, but I was so worried for your life at this point because the amount of blood that came out of you was not, that was not normal. Uh, my mum, oh, my mum, bless her. Many people know that me and my mum are like this. And uh, she's basically like my sister. She was up that end. She was like head deep, like watching, <laughs> full on investigating. So she she was like up the dirty end, like watching it all. Um, so once I hemorrhaged, they obviously had to stitch me up and stop the bleeding. So I've got Bertie on me. My legs are in fucking stirrups by this point. I gave birth with my legs down, I think. They have these weird beds now where you can kind of make weird and wonderful shapes with them so you can kind of accommodate how you want to be. So you don't have to be laid or stood. Yeah. Um, so I'm pretty sure my legs were down. I know to push him out because he had to come up. They had to put my legs in the stirrups right at the end. So I'm full on going into my birth story. I'm so sorry. It's like no, no, it's, it's really cool. It's, because... it's coming out. Yeah. Um, so they had to stop the bleeding. Um, and that took the best part of an hour. Mm. So you've just done labor for, I mean, it was nigh on 24 hours. You've just given birth and you've just been through the most pain in your life. The most painful part of this whole process is my hips in these fucking stirrups. My hips were going to fall off by this point because my sockets had just like solidified. I don't even, they probably just turned into fucking cement. Yeah. My legs were so yeah. painful by this point. And I was like, I just need to take my legs down. I can't have my legs in this position anymore. But they're like, we're not done. We're not done. We're not done. Because they had to do repair the episiotomy. And then they had to, they stopped the bleeding, then they had to repair that and they had to stitch everything else up, which is disgusting. 
and then it was like here's your child well yeah. done you're a mum and you're like what were you like were you like oh my god I didn't cry so when I was pregnant I watched 24 not 24 hours in any one born every minute religiously I was just obsessed okay. with watching people give birth I cried on every single one that I watched it's the most beautiful thing but Bertie came I think I was just so overwhelmed and just in so much pain I was like oh I think I tried to squeeze a tear out for like dramatic effect I was like, oh, please cry I've cried for all these strangers babies being born and I haven't cried for mine um but no he goes he went straight on me skin to skin breastfeeding that was a whole thing the advice that I got for breastfeeding um women do some research because the advice is not great the advice was this if you're on youtube you'll see this grab the baby's hand uh set head and go <laughs> that was it that was that was what they told me <laughs> and that, was, that was exactly what i said what this is the thing isn't it you do hear people say you know when people say like you don't get a rule book or a guide when you become a parent because it's like suddenly but this obviously is a contributor as well if someone's got you know depression or, or anything like that after their pregnancy it's like there is this like overwhelm you, you've got a whole human <laughs> yeah it's, it's this your, your maternal instinct kicks in immediately so that happens automatically the breastfeeding advice that I got just it, it didn't I think again I was so fatigued and maybe I was just so like not with it that I didn't take in what they were saying all I can remember her was just going on my boob on my boob and I was I don't know what means what, what, what do you mean I think that was like that was the noise of the baby latching yeah yeah so you, you're trying to kind of you have to like squeeze your breast this way to like flatten your nipple and then they latch on around that um she could have just said that squeeze your breast this way and let him latch this way but no she made sound effects so breastfeeding for a while breastfeeding for, I was breastfeeding for an hour and a half I was so tired by this point it's like four o'clock in the morning by this point mm. so breastfeed breastfeeded him breastfed him sorry um they had to do his little like baby checks and then poor Rob didn't get to hold him till like I think it was about three four hours after he was born um which he was furious about which I I understand but again there was complications with me so it, it couldn't have really been helped. It was just a case of mum's priority, baby's priority, dad has to wait. Yeah. Um, and then they were like, okay, mum and Rob, you can go home now. I was like, what? They were like, yeah, the the father and the grandparent that you have to leave, you can't stay tonight. I was like, so I'm with the new child by myself. They were like, yes. Oh, so they wheeled me. And they, sorry, they didn't wheel me. I walked. This is, oh, sorry, I passed out in the shower first. So... I can't I'm not even that conscious to look after my own child but I still have to do that by myself um, I think since Covid it was a, a rule where the the parents or the the dad can't stay and for some reason I think in some hospitals it's not changed so they've kind of whisked me off to this ward luckily I'm on my own uh, in my own room but I just remember lying there again it's probably like five six in the morning and I just burst out crying because I was like I can't I can't do this I can't I can't do this I don't know how to change a nappy. I don't know how to breastfeed. I can't do it. He's not latching on. When do I change him? When do I feed him? He's asleep. Do I wake him up? Like all these questions. And I think because it was the middle of the night, um, obviously it's like on call staff. So there wasn't loads of people available. And I just remember I didn't sleep. I just, I, I think I was just shocked. I was overwhelmed. I was in this state of shock. And I remember getting through to kind of eight o'clock in the morning and I called Rob and I just burst out crying. I said, I can't do this. I need your help. And he was like, I'm going to be there as soon as visiting hours open. I'll, I'll wait downstairs and I'll wait for them to let me in, which he was. And I just, I buzzed the midwife, one of the midwives and I, I just burst out crying to her and I was like, I can't do this. And she was like, this is completely normal what you're feeling. It's very overwhelming. It's very normal. She was like, what do you need help with? And I said, can you show me how to change a nappy? And she was like, literally like layman's terms, you do this and you wipe here, like, but you need that reassurance. Like I knew how to change a nappy. I mean, you can figure it out, but I think when you're like mentally and physically just absolutely fucked yeah. and you can't string a sentence together and all you think about is this child is relying on me to keep it alive and I don't know what I'm doing. Um, you just go into this kind of state of shock. And I think being on your own at that point doesn't help. If Rob stayed, I think that probably we could have kind of muddled together and just figured it out. So that was really difficult. And then the first kind of week postpartum, you, you, you're overwhelmed, you're sleep deprived. You don't sleep at all. 
Um, it, it's Emerald. really hard, but you are just kind of in la la land at that point. You're still kind of your baby sleeping all the time, which is great. They wake up to feed, you change them, and they go back to sleep in that first initial week. Um, and then all of a sudden, like oh, all hell breaks loose, and then it just gets worse because baby then doesn't sleep, he cries all the time. You can't figure out what the problem is. Massively impacts the relationship having a child. Say that, yeah. Yeah, it's it's even probably even to this day, if I'm being brutally honest, things are still I wouldn't say fractured. I just think we're almost passing ships. We're on ships. So if I'm not doing a night feed, he's doing a night feed. If I'm doing a night feed, I go to bed early. He's at work all day, comes home, does the bath time. I do the bedtime. I will stay awake for an hour and I go to sleep and then he's up as normal, like normal humans are. So you do kind of live this life. You're just passing and you're just kind of handing the baton over every so often. Um, and I think, again, it's something that's probably not spoken about, but I think most people experience that. There's absolutely been times when we've thought, are we even going to stay together? Because I really dislike you and you really dislike me. And I think that's a very normal emotion to feel when you're in the midst of figuring out how to look after a child. The sleep deprivation, people talk about it, but it, it's it's so real and it's so, it's so challenging and it's so hard and it doesn't get better anytime soon. You just have to, I'm still waking in the night with him now and I'm six months in. Mm. Um, you get used to it. You get used to being sleep deprived, but not for the, the first kind of eight to 10 weeks. That's really challenging. Once you get to there, it tends to get a little bit easier in the sense it becomes normal. Mm. Um, but it affected the relationship. It affected my mental health. And like like we said, like your hormones, again, are going through this massive kind of surge and change to kind of resettle to a homeostasis point. And that, that takes its time. Again, I don't think I'm fully out of it yet. I still think I've, I've got a way to go in regards to how I feel in myself. I feel content. I'm happy and I'm embracing my new life. But like I said at the beginning, your identity changes immediately. And that has been a massive thing now, like the bodybuilder and the mum are two different people and you're trying to find a way to merge them but that's really difficult so at the moment I'm more mum than I am bodybuilder and I'm okay with that mm -hmm. because it means Bertie has the best of me um bodybuilding can come back in and slot in whenever it can and there's plenty of time to figure that out but right now Bertie needs me present and the thought of even remotely doing an off season or anything like that is just absolutely not not in the question at the moment I'm too tired my my day structure just it, it doesn't accommodate bodybuilding at the moment so I just do what I can but I'm absolutely by no means a bodybuilder at the moment I'm I'm just a mum full-time mum that is the this the identity shift that people do struggle with because it's like no matter what your coach says your peers etc cetera, etc cetera, if you're transitioning away from stage for a set period of time yeah. you are riddled with so many different thoughts and feelings and no one's inside your head, are they? And I think that sometimes, like you say about a strain on the relationship, you know, similar to, to bodybuilders in relationships in a prep, it's like it, it, you want to try and communicate how you feel, right? But at times, sometimes you don't want to, and it's almost like you want your other half to to know how you feel. And then you, know, you want them to miraculously go mind read. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sure you probably had similar in that, that frame of mind as like, why isn't he doing X or, you know, that's... Yeah. Enough. and then the conversation comes out and you're like well you didn't tell me and I'm, and then as a female especially females you're like but I, I shouldn't have to tell you yeah. you should know but again I think intuitively we're just very different creatures and I think as women we are a certain way and men are a certain way um and it, it is a massive challenge and it's a challenge that we're still figuring out today and I think a lot of bodybuilding couples as well as new parents I think it's a very similar territory um obviously very different reasons but it's a very similar territory and like you say communication helps but sometimes it's not easy. there's a time and a place for it as well because it's not that simple so having a conversation at a bad time is a recipe for disaster you have to be in kind of a a very calm collected atmosphere to be able to kind of say things that potentially might upset the other person if you're doing that in the heat of the moment you're, you're asking for disaster um, and that's something that we've learned as well especially when you're again battling sleep deprivation and your 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 patience is already running thin you're constantly just like, I'm thinking about him now I know he's napping in the next room I'm watching the time and I'm thinking all these things I'm like he's competent I know he's competent but your brain just doesn't switch off and mm. um, same with prep Mm. You, you know things will get done you know things will happen it's just a case of you can't control it and that's that's what's difficult is that lack of control 
Mm, yeah, for sure. It's like no, no matter what you say with control the controllables, there are times, and I always say with sleep deprivation, there's a reason why it's a torture technique because you get the you get the, the people to give you the information when you sleep deprive them, and that translates into prep motherhood etc do you find that there's been any times when you've been sort of going through this stage where you would resent if you know rob goes to the gym or stuff like that with the link to bodybuilding yeah so for i mean again i don't know if it's just our situation i think as a as a mum when you birth your child like i said the maternal instinct kicks in so your priorities instantly shift like th- there is no process of that. That 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 is instant. As soon as baby's out, everything that was in this order is now in this order, and it, it's automatic. Whereas for men, I think it's a lot. Of, it's a much slower process. I'm I, again. I, this is just speaking on our experience, not by any means putting Rob down because he's been a fantastic dad since day one. I think that adjustment takes a little bit longer for men, and I think women need to understand that that it's not automatic for men. They don't carry a child. Their hormones aren't changing. Nothing's yeah. changing for them their life continues exactly as it was. All of a sudden, they've got a baby to look after and they have to love that baby. We grow the bond with the baby because we spend nine months growing it. Men have to go, here's your child, love it now. Yeah. Um, and I can understand why some men to probably take a little bit of time to feel that kind of instinct, to feel that love for that child. Rob didn't. Rob did instantly feel connected to him. Mm. Um, however, their... Bertie was always a lot more settled with me. Again, I think that's quite natural than he was with dad. And that can probably be quite heartbreaking heartbreaking for the man um, Mm -hmm. when your son or daughter is not happy with you. I think it's a very natural thing. And yeah, I think, again, my battles were my battles and he was probably battling similar, but in a different way. So he was trying to kind of do what he can do to help me without hindering me. And then sometimes it was just best to leave yeah. or to, to go to the gym or to go to work and I think at the beginning stages there was resentment there because he could go he could escape back to his life yeah albeit temporary like even if he's going to work like he's he's still doing something that's a necessity he has to go to work but as a all of a sudden stay at home mum you're like but he gets his freedom I don't get my freedom I don't get any chance in the day to have any freedom whatsoever mm. you're just stuck and initially you're in these four walls and I suffered with crippling anxiety after I gave birth to him. I couldn't leave the house. I, I didn't want to risk taking him out in case he cried and someone in public, I annoyed someone or he annoyed someone, which is completely irrational, but I think you're of a rational mind at that point anyway. So I was just stuck at home. And I think the more that was happening, more my anxiety was kicking in, the more I was resenting him. But I think it's just, it was his way of dealing with it. And I don't, look back now and resent him for it I I understand that that was how he coped and probably sometimes felt like a spare part especially when you're breastfeeding because they can't do anything they can't they can't do anything they can just kind of be there and be like can I get you anything and I feel like at the very and early stages that is pretty much all they can do is just say do you want a drink or do you want some food which don't get me wrong is extremely helpful at that point but as a dad as a new dad I can imagine that's probably a little bit soul destroying when you can't nurture your child like the mother can and all you can do is just be the waiter Mm, mm. because that's what's helpful so I think there was a bit of resentment there but for very different reasons for both of us Mm. um I'm sure if you were to ask him he probably had a little bit of resentment for my relationship with him being instantaneous and we I just knew instinctively what to do whereas I think for the men typically they don't it's a case of they need to learn we've always been very fortunate in our position that I I don't lay the law, but I lay the law. Like oh, I yeah. kind of say, this is how we're going to do it. And he's always said, you decide, I follow, you teach me. It's not been a case of, I want to do it this way or I want to do it this way. I kind of say, this is how we're going to bring up our child, mostly because I have the most knowledge about it. So it's not because I want to control him. It's just, I've done the research and I, this is this is how I want to yeah. nurture him and how I want him to grow up and he's thankfully been super responsive to that and we that's how we parent together now but I think there's probably resentments on both parts for sure mm. um and something that is is a challenge it's really difficult and I think again it's a very normal thing to feel I think anyone that doesn't have that kind of resentment and jealousy of the other person doing one of two things or whichever it is that that's probably not that common and it, it's it's okay to feel like that mm. it, yeah. it's, it's hard it's really hard Um, but it's a very human response to feel in this particular situation 
well even if you know like if you've got an injury and you both train or you 100%. know loads of different scenarios where it's like you get so inside your own head and like you said they're like crippling anxiety the more and more I speak to people on the podcast and you know clients etc cetera, etc cetera, anxiety is so common isn't it Scarlett like and it cripples people like like you and that's the best word because you can't go out the house and you don't know what to do and for yourself it's, it's crazy it, it's so hard it, it's it's something that like I said at the very beginning like I've experienced a bit of anxiety here and there like just throughout life with things getting a little bit tough or you get a bit stressed but nothing like this like I, I couldn't leave the house and I definitely wouldn't say it was depression I don't think it was depression it was just fear of upsetting everyone else mm. like it, it's completely irrational um and it wasn't until I I tried to take him out and I I make a bit of effort I think for the first eight weeks I I probably could count on one hand how many times I left that definitely on one hand how many times I left the house on my own with him with mm. Rob it was easier because you've got company and you've got that support I remember saying to my mum, you're going to have to come up and stay because I need you to, to show me how to take a baby into Costa, to show me how to do a food shop with a baby. I know that sounds really stupid, no, but, but I needed someone to to show me how to manage that. And that's what she did. She was here for a week. And ever since that time, I've been absolutely fine. It's completely settled it. So sometimes I think it is as simple as just someone showing you in layman's terms how to do something, no matter how stupid it is, because that is sometimes you just need that reassurance that, you're doing a good job my sister came up at the very beginning to meet him and she was like you're doing an amazing job like this is amazing she's got two kids so she's got the experience and she knows you're doing a fantastic job you're an awesome mum but sometimes it's like that's not enough like because sometimes words are just words when someone can like physically show you the ropes of something it just makes that process a little bit better to prove that you're doing a good job Telling someone they're doing a good job and showing them that they're doing a good job is two very different things. And then since then, thankfully, I mean, you still have mild anxiety day to day. I don't think that's ever going to go away now I've got a child because you you worry about him. Uh, is he sleeping? Is he breathing? Is he hungry? Does he need a poo? But you, you just learn to live with that. But that, that fear of, it, it was literally a fear of upsetting other people, which is completely mental. But just what if he cries in public? And like everyone's response to that is, he's a baby, he's going to cry. But that doesn't help me. That doesn't make me feel better. That doesn't make me any closer to wanting to take him out. Yeah, taking him out with someone holding my hand, saying he's going to cry now and it's going to be okay, was literally what I needed. Um, and that's what happened. That, that's like anxiety in general, though, isn't it? It's like, it, I really like how you said irrational, because it is, it's, it's irrational. Like, sometimes you can't even place. You, you think, I'm fucking overwhelmed here. Yeah. I don't know why. Like, nothing's bad on the face of it. And and for you, it's like, I've got this baby, like, everything's good. But when, and like you say, when someone's then telling you, it's going to be okay. That's not sometimes what you want to hear. But I like that as a tip, because then people can maybe utilise that. I'd be the same with my mum, for sure. I'd be like, mum, please. Please help me. Please, please help please. me. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly the same as when I said to the midwife on day one, like, I don't know how to change a nappy. And she was like, this is how you do it. And it is just someone explaining something to you in simple terms that you can easily follow and easily understand without being kind of overwhelmed by science or by by big words or something that you probably will just let go of your head. This is exactly the same as when I went to Costa with my mum with him. She was literally like, I'll wait here with the buggy. You order this. And then if you're on your own, this is what you're going to do. Um, and it was it, it, you almost feel a bit silly, but it, it it solved the problem. It's it's now no longer an issue. And I'm sure if we do have a number two, I won't have as bad anxiety next time. I'll be able to go out probably with a toddler uh, and a baby. But I think it's again, it's another human emotion that's very, very big at the moment. And a lot of people probably don't address it. And that's OK if, you, if that's how you deal with it. Um, but I think it's OK to to reach out and to to have that person not just kind of verbally reassure you but if you physically need help like physically ask for help as well for sure now we have got some questions to finish our our episode today Hit me. Um, Hit me. We, we also of course had uh, uh, is she a friend kelly yes she is oh god now oh god. <laughs> now she the the nice bit not a question just to say scarlet's amazing the best mum and deserves happiness thank you baby so very very cute and then she asked about other than terrible mash <laughs> oh no she's mentioned the mash what were your craving oh, she mentioned the mash <laughs> oh. 
so yes my cravings um they weren't crazy uh they were pretty normal things um but potatoes was one of them and I went through a phase of wanting roast potatoes, then mashed potatoes, and then chips. Like it, it had to be a specific type of potato at a specific point. And I'll explain. The mashed potato thing was basically, I couldn't be asked to make mash from scratch or buy it. So I found some powdered mash at home mash. to which, yeah, smash. Um, to which I somehow, somehow curdled when I made it. I don't know how, I don't know what I did, but it was like, it just, it looked like vomit on a plate. Um, I posted it on my Instagram and I still still ate it. And Kelly to this day will never let me live it down. I curdled mashed potato. Um, so thanks for that, Kelly. Appreciate you. <laughs> so um, rich teas. Yeah, rich teas. But uh, to be fair, I'm not going to lie, that is just the craving of life. I, that was before pregnancy and again after pregnancy. I just love rich teas. Um, but definitely potato. I think I mentioned to you on the chat, like Mars bars. It had to be a Mars bar. Couldn't be any anything. It had to be a fucking Mars bar. Egg and crest sandwiches at one point. These are all OG selections, Scarlett. That would be my last choice. <laughs> my absolute last choice. But I wanted egg and crest. These were all first trimester things. It, it tends to die down by the second. Like I said, all pretty normal thing. But it, it's like an insatiable need. Like, I must have this now. Otherwise, I'm going to kill someone. They are intense cravings. They, they, they hit you like a ton of bricks. Um, and it's... Poor partners, you normally have to suffer that and go, right, don't worry, babes, I'm going to go get you with it right now. Oh. So, yeah, they were my three, I think. I think there's probably other stuff, but nothing nothing quite as intense as those three, I remember. <laughs> Egg and Cress, Mars bars and potatoes. What a yeah. connection. I, I said to you, I, I might as well share it with the, the listeners. My So my previous sister-in-law, when I was married before, she craved the jelly in pork pies. Like I said to you, like, That's what? Insane. That is rank. That's absolutely disgusting. I crave bar thing actually as well, like bathing in the bath. Um, okay. I've always been a bit obsessed with smells, like nice smells, like not horrible smells. Even like ever since I was little, like I like reed diffusers and candles and stuff like that. That got heightened in pregnancy, and I was obsessed with smelling everything, making sure it smelled nice. So like, I probably went o- OT on the laundry detergent and stuff like that, and I'd <laughs> bath and I'd have all the bubbles, the oils, and all the things that I probably shouldn't have because I'm pregnant. But I was like, I need the smells. Um, and Bertie's absolutely fine. So <laughs> he's disclaimer, fine. he's fine. <laughs> um, and then we had, so the coaching king said, does she have any plans to come back to BB? So obviously you're so, still sort of a BB as it were, because you're still training, etc. But I guess competing. I think I've, I've basically said to myself mostly, I'm not going to say no and never. But realistically right now, no mainly because like I said we are in talks of a number two so yeah I just don't see it logical to to start kind of pushing myself to to get back to x when I'm probably going to then have to regress again mm-hmm. not to mention the kind of um the pressure that's going to put on my body I'm still in the midst of postpartum and if I wanted to kind of be done at one and then potentially get back on stage, I'd probably be more open-minded to pushing things a little bit harder, but I'm still recovering. And um, again, my priorities have changed. It's how I see bodybuilding now is not how I saw bodybuilding before. Um, That's not to say that I don't like it. Like I still enjoy watching it. I still Mm. support all my friends, but realistically seeing myself back on stage, Mm. I don't want to say no, because I don't want to kind of box myself into that, but it's unlikely, it is unlikely. Also, how how far am I going to regress in this time? And again, I, I don't want it that badly enough to work that hard to to maintain it. Mm-hmm. I'm actually enjoying my new little life now. I'm enjoying not having to eat six meals a day and train like unbelievable. I'm training what I want when I want. I've got no plan at the moment. I'm doing a bit of cardio now. I'm, I'm just doing things that float my boat. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just get the kind of pleasure from helping other people and watching other people. And again, I'll touch on it, the drug side of things. It's something that I never was a massive fan of. I didn't love doing it. I did it because it was pretty much a necessity to to some standard mm. of, of that level anyway. Um, and it's something that I absolutely don't miss. It's something that I absolutely have no aspiration to do again. Um, so again, if I was getting back on stage, I'd probably want to go at the level that I was at. And I think I'd struggle to get there. Um, obviously, everything's evolving as well now. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> if my best from 2022 will be remotely competitive in 2025 26 27 when I would get back on stage 
and then I think the biggest thing of all is I absolutely wouldn't prep for a show all the time Bertie is not in full-time education because it's it's so selfish I, I I would never put that on him I would never want him to suffer because me and or daddy are doing cardio and we have to go first thing in the morning and I know people make it work I know people train at stupid o'clock in the morning and I don't want to do that yeah, yeah. I don't love it that much to want to go and train at four o'clock in the morning when everyone's asleep um and I wouldn't ever let him be exposed to the the negative sides of mummy and daddy aren't present mm. um so it absolutely wouldn't be until he's in full-time education like reception school when he's at school all day when I would have the time to then be selfish in that period of time um so I I wouldn't want it to impact him and nor would I really want him to grow up I was wondering that when you said that yeah not yeah, that it's too. a bad industry to be around I just I want him to make his own decisions in life and I don't want him to to be not brainwashed but just to be warped into thinking a, a false sense of reality like this is this is how I should live I should eat six meals mm -hmm. a day and I should have high protein and I should I should be eating chicken and rice like I want him to be a child like if you want to have McDonald's and it's not too much you can have McDonald's mm -hmm. you don't have to go to the gym at 10 years old you can go to the gym if you ever want to go to the gym so just kind of not forcing our lifestyle upon him if he wait if he grows up and he says I would like to do I'd like to go to the gym absolutely I'd like to try bodybuilding absolutely please don't take drugs though but if you do your dad is the best person to speak yeah. to so as long as Rob would help him through it but it has to be his choice mm. um it's it's not something that I would promote to him but mm. if he wanted to absolutely but yeah I think a lot of that is just down to to being selfish and not being present I think I I wouldn't be able to to sleep at night yeah for sure just get him into gymnastics I would love him to do gymnastics I would love him to do ballet to be honest because that's what I did now we have one more question to finish up from Tamara she is an avid listener how has she dealt with the body changes with being a competitor to being pregnant so we sort of touched on that already I guess a good way to sort of surmise would be maybe like three of the top things or, or the the big things that when you're suddenly bigger around the pelvis around the stomach were you telling yourself certain like mantras or anything like that or I think I think my advice would be is one accept it for what it is because it's going to change so you can fight it as much as you want whether it changes massively or a little bit something is going to change so just accept that you're hopefully choosing to have a child and you're choosing to be pregnant so you, your choice now is that's your first priority how you look shouldn't be a massive priority to you that being said is difficult so what I would say is as much as you can I know I said in the first trimester you kind of just get through it um but when you do come into the second and when you do feel good and you do feel like you can flourish and you can get a bit more kind of routine like try and create a bit of a routine I absolutely was not a bodybuilder on on, on prep in my pregnancy, um, but I still trained. I still ate somewhat well. I didn't eat like an asshole. I still ate like two, three good meals or snacks a day, and then I'd have like an evening meal. So you can control a little bit, um, mm. and that's more so postpartum. So again, just really quickly, like I said, I flourished in my pregnancy. I looked great and I felt fantastic. I didn't really put on any weight. It wasn't until postpartum when you lose your baby weight that you realize how much body fat you actually do put on. And that's not because you eat like a dickhead. That is because your body is then insulating a child. So that is just a natural process. So you will be different postpartum. Your skin will be softer. Your hips will be wider. You will have more body fat. Whether you try hard not to, you will have more body fat. And you just have to accept it for what it is. Fortunately, in our industry, if you are kind of within the fitness industry, we do have the knowledge and access to knowledge now to be able to change that and to manipulate that. So it, it's not permanent. It doesn't have to be permanent. Mm. It's just a time and a place when you feel ready to make that change. If you do want to kind of go back to where you were, that being said, it might not be a hundred percent back to where you were because your body has adapted probably forever, but you can absolutely get back in shape. So I think just, just know that in the back of your mind that you can change it and there's no pressure to change it immediately. Mm -hmm. that, I, that's what I say in off season it's like it's your temporary body isn't it you I, I say not everyone can diet to stage lean but you know you know you can diet if it's someone going back to stage and they need to do a long off season it's like 
you know a diet's like you know within four or five months you're pretty much getting to stage condition so accepting it for what it is and that's a lot of the lessons it sounds like you've learned in all of the what you've been through in the phases as it were it's like I need to accept that this is now my new life and my, and my different yeah. priorities but I feel like this will help a lot with even aside from pregnancy yeah no it, it it just is one of those things isn't it control the controllable and if if you if you hate something that much you'll make a change um but sometimes it's timing and again using myself as an example I'm absolutely not ready yet to 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 try hard to to pull back into a shape that I consider for Same me way. Obviously, I can post a picture of my body now online and everyone would be like, you look fantastic. But that's not my optimal physique. Yeah. Um, and I'm just not mentally or physically ready to want to do that right now. So I, I wouldn't choose to diet at all at the moment. I'm still on my rich tea hype in the morning. You're a little yeah. Albert as well. <laughs> I know. I know. I will, I will share with you before we clock off that me and Matt have spoken about if we have a child and we have a boy. I want to call him Eric. Oh my god, yes. I know. I'm like yes. now I've heard Albert, I'm like, it's fucking happening. Because we we were like joking, like if we have a second boy, um Rob was like, What about Bert and Ernie? I was like, babes. <laughs> babes. And then what? a girl were like thinking about like really old fashioned names for girls. And I was like, I draw the line at Gertrude. Like, no offense to anyone that's called Gertrude, but that's for me the little bit too old school. Um, but it's 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 a crazy journey. And if you or anyone else you do get pregnant at some point and you do have children I will warn you now choosing a name for your child is one of the most stressful things in the world you can sit and talk about names before you have babies and it's it's an easy conversation but when you're actually pregnant and this thing has to carry this name around for the rest of their life and that's your decision <laughs> they may resent you for the rest of their life so <laughs> it's it's really challenging but um it's, it's always good fun what a way to wrap up well of course thank you and i will put your instagram in the description of the episode i'm sure your inbox will be open if anyone wants to reach out off the back absolutely. of absolutely yeah again it's sort of like your message if it goes to message requests it will be answered um but i'm kind of a bit fearful of my message request because it is just spam and or like sex accounts like asking me for i have got what can you send me a photo of your feet and a pair of socks yeah, like weird shit like that. So I just tend to kind of go. No, thank you. <laughs> so Ignore. We'll get back to you if you do message, of course. And as long as you don't message me weird shit like that. <laughs> I'm sure that's you. No, you're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a really pleasure. Nice to meet you. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Give Bertie a hug from me. He sounds. Like I will do. You. <laughs> he he is. I'm biased, but he is the best thing in the world. He's so cute. Love it. Thank you, Scarlett. You're welcome, my love. Bye.